third speaker is Justice John Ingram, and um, I'm honored to introduce Judge Ingram because not only I am his law clerk, so um, we were joking at work that um, he had to be nice to me this week because I was introducing him, so <laughs> he had to be he had to be very nice, which he always is. Um, Justice Ingram was appointed to the New York State Court of Claims by Governor George Pataki on June 23, 2003. He was initially assigned to the Supreme Court in Bronx County, where I first met him, and had a narcotics part and a trial part. In June 2005, he was reassigned to Supreme Court Kings County um, and presided over a criminal, par criminal part in the um, criminal division. Um, and on June 20th, 2013, Judge Ingram was um, appointed um, as a Justice of the Supreme Court by Governor Andrew Cuomo. Um, he's currently a trial judge in the criminal term of the Supreme Court and deals with felonies in Brooklyn. Um, prior to his current position on the bench, uh, Judge Ingram um, practiced with Burlingham, Underwood, Wright, White, and Lord and became a partner of the firm in 1976. In 1995, Judge Ingram formed the firm of Mortacci and Ingram, specializing in litigation. Um, after, um, he then became a partner of Healy and Bailey in April 1996, until he went on the bench in June 2003. Um, Judge Ingram graduated from the State University of New York at Maritime College. Um, with a Bachelor of Science in Mar Marine Transportation, and he sailed as a third mate and second mate above aboard U.S. flag fighters, container ships, and passenger ships. Um, he retired from the Navy Reserve as a captain and holds a third mate's license issued by the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, he recently retired from the New York Naval Militia with the rank of Rear, Ad rear Admiral um, in the courthouse. A lot of times people um, don't call him Judge Ingram, they say, how's the Admiral doing? Um, <laughs> so um, he was Deputy Commander responsible for Homeland Security missions um, in the New York State waterways. Um, again, on a, on a personal note, I, I know the judge obviously extre extremely well. Um, you'll be hearing from law clerks of Justice Scalia about the tight relationship that law clerks have with judges. Um, you're with them all day. Um, in a small chambers, um, and the judge always says, I think you know more me better than most people, which is the same for him. <laughs> um, and you have a tight um, relationship. And so um, as a law clerk, your, your happiness really depends on who your judge is. And so I've been fortunate enough to work for Judge Ingham for 10 years and excited to go to work every day. And um, he always, he has a great sense of humor, um, for, which is difficult um, in his position <coughs> dealing with um, really heavy criminal cases um, in Kings County. Um, and he always says that his number one job is to make me laugh every day, which he does. He does do that. Um, and, you know, we, we deal with each other all the time, and um, I have to protect him. That's my job to make sure that he doesn't get reversed. And when I do give my opinion on matters he does not agree with, he said, you know, we rarely fight. Let's not start now. So, <laughs> um, so you know, um, he does deal with um, numerous press cases, um, high profile cases, and really very complex cases. Um, and he is a tough judge. I, I will say that. Um, I was in the courtroom one day, and one of the attorneys, I never told him this, said, um, when's Scalia coming back on the bench? And I said, oh. So he's a, he's a, a little a more, a more conservative than many of the judges in the city, but um, that's in this day, that's not really saying that much because there are a lot of, I think, a, a, little, a little more liberal um, side of the judges in New York City. Um, and I'm, we laugh that we get along so well because uh, we make a good combination, the Irish and the Italian, so we balance each other. 
balance each other out. And so I am very interested in hearing his talk about the Irish and Italian relationship um, because I left when I saw the title because he always jokes that he's an equal opportunity employer because he hired me an Italian. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Justice John Ingram. That was completely unrehearsed. I never heard that before. But I, I, Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, first off, I, I do want to thank Dr. Mignon for this wonderful uh, uh, symposium. I think a round of applause for Dr. Mignon. Uh, the, uh, I, 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 I happen to be a member of the Union of University Professionals. I, I'm an adjunct professor at State University, so I share your thoughts about it. But I guess I'm one of the very few judges, Gail, to be a member of a union. I don't know if that's kosher or not for us <laughs> Irish judges, Irish-American judges. But I, I, uh, it's, it's really great for me to be uh, at this most beautiful, illustrious university. Uh, my son, Sean, graduated from State University of New York, Stony Brook, the business school, uh, back in 19, uh, I believe it was 1989. And then he uh, went into the uh, Prudential Securities and then went to Northeastern for a master's and now is a senior VP at uh, Marsh Insurance. Uh, my brother, Martin, uh, has two master's degrees from this fine university. Uh, my son also played basketball for one year with Stony Brook. Uh, he wasn't good enough to make that championship team eventually. But it's really great to be here, and it's great to see the students. I commend you for being up so early in the morning. Uh, it's, I, I really feel like I'm at home here with uh, Gail Prudenti, who was uh, my presiding judge, and uh, a governor made a mistake by not putting Gail onto the Court of Appeals, but she was found highly qualified on the two occasions that she was screened for that position. Uh, uh, good luck beats early rising, Justice Scalia said uh, about his appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court. He talked about his friend Bob Bork, who went through a horrendous confirmation hearing, and uh, Bob Bork uh, decided to pull his name. But uh, Justice Scalia, uh, on the one occasion that I met him, uh, talked about the confirmation and the ethnic situation. But before I get to that, I do want to thank Elizabeth for that marvelous introduction. Uh, you didn't hear about Elizabeth's academic background. She's a graduate of Boston College, where uh, my two Ita Irish, Italian, American grandsons are currently uh, at a very fine Jesuit uh, institution in Boston. And thereafter, she went to St. John's University School of Law and uh, was hired on by Rob Johnson, the district attorney of Bronx County. And uh, she was a uh, very skillful, successful prosecutor for seven years in the Bronx Supreme Court, criminal court first, and then the Bronx Supreme Court. And actually, uh, she tried a case before me uh, and uh, got a conviction, which was a hard thing for a prosecutor in the Bronx County to do uh, by the time it went to trial. But uh, she was a, a very zealous prosecutor and um, then went into private practice for a short time with the firm of Lester Schwab. And uh, of course, like so many great prosecutors, uh, they really didn't like civil practice. They didn't like timesheets. So uh, when it came time to come back, uh, she came to me with a very high recommendation from the chief of narcotics in the Bronx Supreme Court. And of course, uh, as she said, I was equal opportunity hiring. Uh, uh, she went to St. John, so did I, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, affirm it was no affirmative action. And of course, when she got the job with me, she said, and by the way, Judge, I'm, I'm getting married next month. Do you mind? I said, good for you. That's great. Lucky guy. So I was at the wedding, of course. Uh, uh, and then, of course, I, I sort of feel like an honorary grandpa, uh, Dr. Mignotti, in that uh, Elizabeth has three beautiful children. And, of course, I visited, I think, each one in the hospital as they were born. And we see them. Uh, we come out to our summer place in Breezy Point. Uh, so it's, it's really great. She's got a great guy as a husband. So she's... Uh, uh, I, I'm very fortunate to have her. And I know the law clerks that were with Justice Scalia. The federal system is somewhat different, although uh, we did talk briefly this morning. Some federal judges keep one law uh, clerk permanently. 
Most federal judges rotate. They have two law clerks, and they're constantly rotating. So, uh, like my good friend Judge Deary says, he's constantly you know, training or retraining law clerks. Well, I'm so fortunate to have Elizabeth, who keeps me out of trouble. But uh, you might say, what is an Irish American uh, being asked to speak at this conference for? Well, I consider myself very fortunate. Uh, I have four children. Two of my children have, uh, quote, intermarried Italian Americans. So I have uh, two, I have two grandsons, uh, Ryan James Mucho Grosso, uh, Justin Mucho Grosso, and my son Brian married Jennifer Cuneo from Garden City, and they have two beautiful children as well. But uh, my, I was fortunate to be in private practice for 34 years, and my, the firm I was with uh, represented the Italian line in the uh, Andrea Doria case, which was 60 years ago this summer, 60 years ago. And I actually spoke at a symposium at the Maritime College on the Andrea Doria. And I represented the Italian line agency and spent considerable amount of time in Genoa, in Genoa, with Sergio Cravato and Sergio Torchi. We represented the Italian line and the underwriters Levante and Coma. So the little bit of Italian that I learned as a child was <laughs> it put me in good stead representing Italian underwriters in the early 80s in Genoa. But uh, uh, I thought, I, I grew up in Jackson Heights, Queens, about a mile away from where, uh, two miles away from where Justice Scalia lived in Elmhurst. Uh, we're probably about eight years apart. He attended Xavier High School. Uh, in Manhattan on West 16th Street, and I attended Bishop Lachlan High School in downtown Brooklyn, uh, in Clinton Hill now, Fort Greene. Uh, but I remember the Xavier guys because we called them subway commandos in that they all in high school were part of the Army Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps, which meant, uh, and he's, he's spoken about it, we talked about it, where we call them subway commandos. They had to wear their uniforms every day. They wore army green. On Friday, they wore dress blue. And he was a proud Xavier graduate. And it, I think, it's, as other speakers have said, his Catholic upbringing, his Jesuit high school education, his education at Georgetown, uh, possibly he was discriminated, that he was probably kept out of some of the so-called Ivies. Because, indeed, there was discrimination against Italian-Americans, against the Irish. And I just read a very interesting book called The Unholy Alliance, The Love-Hate Relationship Between the Irish and the Italians uh, by Peter Moses. Uh, and it's a terrific book. Uh, but I actually lived through that or with that. I mean, Rudy Giuliani was a year behind me in high school. He was class of 1961 or whatever from Lachlan. And, but the high school I went to was probably half Irish, half Italian. And growing up, growing up in Queens, but I, I look back at the history, and uh, as Gail mentioned, Judge Prudenti mentioned, about the ethnic slurs and how stupid they were, where they called Italian Americans guineas or calling them dagos. And when you really look at this, those slurs, the guinea came from the slave trade, where people paid guineas for black African slaves. Dago was that <coughs> slur dealing with people who were Spanish, and they called the Italians that. So it made no sense, these stupid ethnic slurs. But we look back historically in New York, where you really didn't have a very large Italian population until the 1890s and the early 1900s. And then you look at the Roman Catholic Church, and you look at uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who lived in Manhattan after his war injuries in the 1850s, and then moved to Staten Island. He actually had a sausage factory in Staten Island, and then went back to fight the papal wars. And he had referred to Pius IX as Lucifer. He was very, the, the, there was a really animosity in the Roman Catholic Church 
to Italian nationalists who were trying to take back the land, take back Rome, from the papal authorities. And that, that, discrim that caused discrimination by the Irish Catholic hierarchy in New York City against Italian priests, Italian nuns, Mother Cabrini. Mother Cabrini was sent over by, I believe it was Leo III, to help out the Italian population, particularly in New York City, who were being discriminated against by the Irish Catholic hierarchy. And so when she came with six nuns, they said, you really should probably go back to Italy and stay away. And she hooked up with the Sisters of Charity, and she went on to probably be the first Italian-American woman canonized by the Roman Catholic Church in 1956. So the discrimination was not only in the Catholic Church. And when you look at some of the leading uh, politicians, the Italian politicians, Fiorello LaGuardia, his mother was Jewish, father was Italian, served in the U.S. Army, a Republican mayor in the city. But uh, the... Uh, The so-called, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, the so-called Italian problem in the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, those things interfered with people. The discrimination uh, was in the labor unions, where a lot of the labor unions were controlled by the Irish, particularly the waterfront, the transit. Uh, I happened to work in the Brooklyn waterfront <laughs> while I was going to St. John's Law School when it was in downtown Brooklyn. And it was amazing how in the early 60s, 1960s, there were approximately 30,000 longshore workers, harbor workers, and about half of them <coughs> were Italian-American. And the way the docks were uh, drawn up, the Italian-American or the Italians had the Brooklyn docks. The Irish had the west side of Manhattan. The blacks then, now African-Americans, had the port of Newark. And in Brooklyn, we had Anthony Scotto, who was the president of Local 1814 of the ILA, which I, International Longshoremen's Association, which I always refer to as I Love America. And uh, Anthony was the president of that local and also the international vice president, and had Teddy Gleason. Uh, Anthony Scotto's daughter is Roseanne Scotto on Channel 5, the uh, very prominent uh, newscaster. But there was discrimination. And of course, as Gail could appreciate, there was a lot of litigation involving uh, injured harbor workers and longshoremen, particularly in the Supreme Court, Kings County, Civil Size, and the Appellate Division. And the, a lot of the injured fellows uh, went to Italian law firms, Italian American law firms, D. Costanza, Tonsky, and Catrona, Anthony, uh, Tony Catrona, who became a judge in our court. Uh, and it, there was uh, a lot of so much, so much litigation, and we've had so many great Italian Americans. And, and Gail stole a little of my thunder about the Rapallo Award. Charles Rapallo was elected to the Court of Appeals in 1870, and uh, there is the Rapallo Award that is given every year by the Colombian lawyers. And of course, Gail was a recipient of that award. I believe it was in 2007. <laughs> I have the list here someplace, but it, the the uh, and of course uh, Justice Scalia received that award. Here, yeah, here it is. Uh, Justice Scalia received that award in 1993, and Gail Gail received that award. I'm sorry, in 2011, and uh, John Barone, a good friend from the Bronx, received it in 2015, and uh, this year. Uh, Judge Grafeo, who just stepped down from the Court of Appeals, uh, received it in 2016. That award by the Colombian lawyers, which was called the Rapallo Award, now has changed its name to the Rapallo Scalia Award. So uh, the law enforcement initially uh, was another place that discriminated against Italian Americans until there was a Lieutenant Petrosino uh, from the New York City Police Department who went to Sicily and was assassinated in uh, Sicily uh, by the so-called mafia, uh, organized crime. And, and, and then, so when you look at the New York City Police Department, they've come a long way from what used to be an Irish organization. 
But uh, the last chief of the department was uh, Joe Esposito, who's now the chief of uh, emergency services for the office. Uh, the, but now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, Justice Scalia and his marriage to Maureen McCarthy. So he uh, actually spoke in 1988 at the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick of the City of New York. And I was interested to, I wondered whether uh, his uh, current law clerks may have helped write his address. But people still talk about the night that Justice Scalia spoke to 2,000 mostly Irish American men uh, at a wonderful dinner in New York. And I was privileged to be in a small group that met before the general cocktail party. But uh, he said that uh, to us that when uh, we talked about him being invited, he said, I'm a New York kid. I went to Xavier down the block and marched in the St. Patrick's Day Parade for four years. And this is a great homecoming. He first thanked everybody, of course, and said all the nice things that people do with those things. And he said something which, he had a great delivery. He, he as, as Gail said, he was a very funny man. I mean, talk about a Renaissance guy, you know, somebody who's into opera, into marksmanship. You know, he was a great hunter. He taught Justice Kagan how to fire a rifle. He went to the opera with uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, and he was just an amazing, a great cook. He liked his wine. Uh, but he said, uh, being in the midst of uh, such spirited con uh, convivability is difficult. It places a special burden on me because I'm supposed to always be as sober as a judge. Or indeed, sober as a justice, which is presumably even soberer than a judge. And he said that he was frankly amazed about the invitation, but thought that possibly the friendly sons of St. Patrick of the City of New York were going to try to get uh, Justice Scalia to take his wife's uh, maiden name, which would have been McCarthy. <laughs> and so then the Irish would have had Brennan, O'Connor, McCarthy, uh, McCarthy, and Kennedy on the uh, Supreme Court. But... Uh, he said, he said, he said a really funny thing. He said, he said, you know, I, I normally don't like after dinner speeches. He says, I thought, I think they may have been invited, invented by the English, certainly not the Sicilians. <laughs> but uh, he also he had some great lines. He told, he told a great story. Uh, and I wish Senator Laval was still here, but I, I, I know the senator. He was on my confirmation committee uh, when I had to go before the New York State Senate. And he's a very busy man, and uh, I truly hope and pray that, of course, I can't be involved in politics, but he's done a great job for the people of the state of New York, and particularly uh, Suffolk County. Uh, but he's, he's a terrific guy. And I actually sat with him, I think, at Elizabeth's uh, wedding in that beautiful uh, uh, reception place. But he talked about Scalia, getting back to Scalia, he talked about how in the 1880s uh, we still had capital punishment, which we do have in some states. I think fortunately not our state of New York, uh, at least by the state courts. Uh, but uh, in the 1880s in, in Kansas, a hanging for a capital offense was something that was well attended by all the people in the surrounding counties. So this poor fellow was going to be uh, hung uh, because of a capital offense. And uh, the presiding officer at the execution said, young man, we have a custom here in Kansas uh, that uh, before sentence is executed, the condemned man has the opportunity to address the crowd for five minutes. The young man said, you know, gee, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor, but I'm really not much in the mood for a speech. <laughs> so everybody, you know. So the, the mayor said, I assure you, young man, that we will not censor your address. The US Supreme Court would not let us do that. You can say anything you like. You can unveil against 
the quality of Kansas justice. You can say the judge was fixed. Whatever you want to say, go right ahead. The young man said, uh, gee, Mr. Mayor, thank you, but I'm just not in the mood. <laughs> well, out there in the audience, was, uh, I was going to say uh, Senator Laval, uh, <laughs> but he's not here, but I'll say it anyhow. <laughs> Senator, Senator Laval said, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd like to take, well, the gentleman yield his five minutes. So the mayor looked over at the young man and said, young man, Senator Laval down here would ask whether you would like uh, him to take your, would you let him take your five minutes to speak to the crowd? The young man thought about it for a moment and said, well, uh, okay, but hang me first. <laughs> and, and, and this, these, I, I actually saved this speech. I had to, you know, this speech was probably one of the best uh, I've ever heard. And uh, he said, you know, uh, I told you my views about after dinner speakers, and uh, I don't want to be the person. No, we have a little time. I don't want to be the person between you and your lunch. But uh, he said that when he was at Georgetown, uh, the Jesuits told him that the best advice for after dinner speakers uh, was uh, like uh, regarding the same advice given to unmarried cu couples regarding kissing. Uh, the, he, the term given was leviter and breviter. And as he said, and for you young Catholic priests, that means in Latin, lightly and briefly. So uh, he, has, he said he had reason to believe that that advice has been no more effective for after dinner <coughs> speakers than it had been for the unmarried couples. But uh, the, he talked uh, about... Uh, his own class of 1953 at the Xavier High School where he picked up his yearbook and he said he went to the yearbook and he found names like Armortino, Antonelli, Bonomo, Bogoni, and Sergio. But when it came to the M's, and I'm not joking, he said, it reads like this, Mahaney, Mahoney, McAvoy, McCarthy, McCory, McCrover, McGuire, McGinn, McGinn. So, in other words, he went to a school that was probably 60% Irish. Uh, I didn't mention, I meant to mention, that my godfather, my uncle, is Angelo Busolino. His family was from Milano. And in 1943, uh, Angelo married Josephine McCann at Blessed Sacrament Church on the west side of Manhattan. And my dad was a New York City police officer during the war, during LaGuardia's time. <coughs> And my mom was about ready to deliver me. Uh, and of course, in those good old days, it's not like today, where that meant nothing. Dad still had to you know, patrol the 10th precinct on the west side of Manhattan. So Uncle Buzzy, Uncle Angelo, who worked in his mom and dad's restaurant in, in uh, 53rd Street, he was on his honeymoon with my Aunt Josephine and they were going to spend the week at the family chateau, the little bungalow out in Breezy Point. Well, nature called, and my mom had to go to St. Elizabeth Hospital to, to deliver me. So Uncle Buzzy was, he had my grandfather's car. He drove to St. Elizabeth's, took me to St. Elizabeth's and I was born. And thereafter, he was going back to Breezy Point to uh, continue with his honeymoon. And he ran out of gas on the main road. <laughs> Now you have to think about this. Some of you people may remember 1943 was the war, and you had to have a gasoline ration book for your car. So he didn't have the gasoline ration book. So he left the car in the state road, walked in about a mile and a half. The next day, he went down to the local restaurant where they had a phone, Kennedy's, and called my grandfather, John J. McCann, who was the chief clerk of the old municipal court, having been a court officer in the good old days of the McManus Democratic Club in the West Side, where tomorrow, McCann, you're a court officer, you got a badge and a, and a gun, and have a great life, and he became the chief clerk. Well, in those days, there really wasn't a lot of thrilling things between the Buzzolino family and the McCann family. So here, my Uncle Buzzy has to call my grandfather and say, I ran out of gas with your car, and I need your gas book, and it was a great story. But uh, it was, he was, 
a Xavier graduate uh, who went to Villanova and took over one of the best restaurants in New York, the Rose Restaurant, and unfortunately he died young of diabetes in his mid-60s. But uh, he was a very special influence in my life. Uh, and that's where I learned to type in the kitchen of, of the restaurant with the guys. Uh, one of the things that Scalia said about his wonderful wife, Maureen, who was, a, I guess she was a Cliffy from Radcliffe, and he met her in his last year at Harvard. And he said that his, uh, one of the things that uh, the subtle Sicilians liked about the Irish was their bluntness. He said, there's very little beating around the bush with many of the Irish. You always know where you stand. My wife, Maureen, has this endearing quality to a preeminent degree. An example that occurs to me is not really uh, uh, Maureen's own line, but a cartoon obviously inspired by an Irishman, which she left on the breakfast table shortly after I had been confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. It shows a stern-looking, paunchy fellow, which increasingly fits my description, sitting at the breakfast table across from his wife, reading the paper. And Maureen, I mean the wife in the cartoon, is saying, quote, while you are a conservative jurist who believes in judicial restraint, you are also a louse. <laughs> Bluntness is important. Not only because it lets people know where they stand, but also because it toughens them up. Life is not an enterprise for sissies. The Irish know that, and they treat both themselves and others with a kind of benevolent roughness designed to prepare them for the world. This was brought home in his first day at a class at Xavier. Scalia, then a 13-year-old, had taken the subway from Queens, walked into a strange classroom with a lot of strange faces, wearing strange military uniforms of dress blue. My new homeroom teacher, Father Tom Matthews, an Irishman, if there ever was one, went, went down the roster to the class, calling out each cadet's name to see what he looked like. He came to Antonin Scalia. He mispronounced Antonin. Everybody does. Actually, I'm not sure how it should be pronounced. <laughs> anyway, I shall never forget the first benevolent, toughening Irish words he said to me. Who's your patron saint? Anyway, uh, he talked about the uh, consistencies of the Irish Americans in both friendships and in enmities. If he, he said that... Uh, there's one problem the Republicans have had in weaning the Irish away from the Democratic Party. The story is told that Teddy Roosevelt was once given in which he repeatedly was heckled by an Irishman standing in the back who kept on shouting, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. So Teddy, after a while, said, why are you a Democrat? And the heckler replied, my grandfather was a Democrat. My father was a Democrat. And I'm a Democrat. Well, said Teddy, thinking he had the man, said, if your father was a jackass and your grandfather was a jackass, what would you be? He said, a Republican. <laughs> uh, this consistency is, as I say, displayed towards enemies as well as towards friends. One of the most characteristic Irish prayers is the following. May those who love us, love us. And those that don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, May he turn their ankles so we will know them by their limping. <laughs> Another characteristic of the Irish, perhaps the most endearing, is their lightheartedness, a result, no doubt, of the depth of their belief in the hereafter. It's only a short time here, so there's no use taking it all too seriously. <laughs> I love that line. Uh, 
He said uh, he talked about uh, how the Irish uh, act at wakes. He talked about his wife's uncle Dave in South Boston a few years back where his uh, wife's mother, Mary Fitzgerald McCarthy, was sitting in the home when one of Dave's elderly friends came in, obviously somewhat confused and befuddled about where he was to go. Before he could even say, I'm so sorry for your troubles, Mary McCarthy said, as natural as she could, you'll be looking for Dave, he's up front. That's a true story. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, he said, uh, it is that same carelessness about life, I suppose, that makes the Irish so fond of fighting. Being a man of the law, I do not feel free to dwell upon that fine quality except to recall the wonderful lines of C.K. Chesterton. Quote, for the great gales of Ireland are the men that God made mad, for all of their wars are merry and all of their songs are sad. <coughs> the, he, he said, the, uh, he talked about the Irish brogue of Mike Quill, and of course he said he misses that today. But he talked about the legend of Blarney and how Queen Elizabeth I uh, used that term. He said the, uh, the, he, he said, he had a great line, he said, first of all, there's the music, the Irish music. I swear, I can't tell one Irish song from another unless it's written by <laughs> Irving Berlin. And there's the cu cuisine. My brother-in-law thinks an Irish seven-course dinner is a six-pack of beer and a potato. Yeah. That got a lot of laughs in that crowd at that time of the evening. But uh, uh, he said, and, I, and it's so true, the Irish are a great race. I'm glad to have grown up with them. I'm glad to have married into them. And I'm glad to live in a country where their good qualities have made such a difference. And I think some of our other speakers have been talked about the ethnic pride that Justice Scalia had. And he at one time said, you know, there's no such thing as a, uh, a Catholic uh, uh, judge. There's no such thing as a Catholic hamburger. Uh, you know, you cook, you, you become a judge, you, you try to apply the law. And as Dr. Mignon said, he, he basically said the Constitution is dead. And if you want to change it, do it by amendment. And we know there's only been about 27 amendments to the United States Constitution. Uh, and I think uh, one of the decisions, and I don't know if uh, Justice Scalia's law clerks uh, uh, had anything to do with the Heller opinion, and for Second Amendment enthusiasts, I commend that case. Uh, I somewhat recall when I went to law school about a thousand years ago, uh, we heard that, you know, uh, 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 the, basically, it was the militia that had the right to keep and bear arms. And, of course, Justice Scalia really went through the history in the Heller case of even going back to the English courts where the king, who was Catholic at the time, said the Protestants couldn't be armed because of uh, insur possible insurrection. Uh, as, as a judge who sits in a court uh, where we ha in a county where we have some of the strongest gun laws in the United States of America. We have way too many people with guns. We have too many shootings. Even out here in Suffolk County, uh, we had two young women, I believe, killed the other night. And then in Hempstead, Nassau, the <coughs> shooting. There's way too many guns in our country. And, uh, but his, his opinion uh, in Heller uh, is just fantastic reading. And as somebody said, the way he, he addressed the issues, and uh, he will be missed, and may he rest in peace. God bless.